I hear the head table clearly. Please do write something and hear. How about now? Do you hear me now when I speak? Chris, can you say a few words? Uh, sure, I can. Welcome to the fifth session of the convention. Yeah. Uh, we have the most uncomfortable chair as possible. No, the bishop. Uh, these are different pairs to make you feel that. Yeah. Uh, so Turn them around to me. Can you see that? Really? Convention will come to order. We return this morning to the fourth session of the convention. Presentation of the 2020 budget. Before we begin, I'll just say a brief word about the process of the budget. A longer explanation of this is found in the delegates packet. We thought it was important to be clear about the work that goes into preparing both the financial report and the budget that comes before you. <clears throat> there are three basic pieces of our budgeting process which reflect our system of shared governance. It begins with the bishop because the bishop's primary task is to assure the alignment between the mission priorities of the convocation and the allocation of the resources entrusted to us by the faithful. 
So my task at the beginning of our process, which takes place in March, is to work with Sophie, who has a very clear view of the expected revenues that we see coming in the year to come, and to prepare a budget for the coming year that is then submitted to the Finance Committee. I bring that to the Finance Committee at their May meeting at which time they also consider the grant requests that our congregations have submitted. They hear my case for why I think we should divide up the resources that we have in the way that I have proposed. And out of that meeting comes a budget that is then sent forward to the Council of Advice. The Council of Advice gets its own chance to hear input from both the Bishop and the Finance and in September, at the meeting last before this convention, the council gives final form to the proposed budget. So this is the work of many hands, and it's brought to you after a lot of consideration and prayer. That doesn't mean it can't be questioned. That doesn't mean that we are not answerable for the recommendations we bring to you. But it does mean that this hasn't simply been pulled out of there are thinking behind. With that, I now turn to the treasurer, Denis Lengoulac, whom I spoke last night, to present to you the audited financial position for 2020. Thank you, Bishop. Twenty twenty was a terrible year for all of us, personally, in our... You want me to speak up, or you want me to speak up? Bring the microphone closer to my... Can you hear me? I've always said that masks make people hard of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a terrible year for all of us, personally, in our congregations, in our daily lives. But strangely enough, it was not a bad year for the, for the congregation from a financial point of view. Uh, the budget for, for the, the fiscal year result, uh, 2020, was positive to a degree that we hadn't anticipated for several reasons. One is that our budgets were underspent, especially those of commissions. To a certain degree, clergy support, you can read, I, I, I take it that you've read the documents that were sent, so I'm not going to read them for you. But if you need some explanation on, cer on certain items, I'm ready to, to give them. But budgets were underspent. Income was higher than expected, than budgeted, in spite of a cut of 5% in the assessments that the council decided uh, at the bishop's invitation in the spring of 2020. But we got a major boost from the Board of Foreign Parishes after the beginning of the pandemic and when we started anticipating financial problems for our congregations, we got, as you know, a $250,000 package from the Board of Foreign Parishes, half of which being an uh, interest-free loan of a period of five years, and half of it between being a grant to the congregation. All these funds, the grants were redistributed to the, to the congregations and the loans were, loans were extended as requested uh, by the congregation. So uh, we, the congregation itself didn't keep any of these funds, but maybe a couple of thousand euros from, from the loan because they hadn't been requested. All this means that at the end of the year, 
the operating result of the convocation was in excess of 160,000, close to 165,000 euros. This helped tremendously because decisions had been made at the end of 2019 to remove the Rothon Fund from the, con the convocation's balance sheet. It is not it, it, it was a simple clarification. Ownership of the Rosen Fund had never been clear from the, from, the, from the beginning. And after discussions with our legal advisors and the Board of Foreign Parishes and the Chancellor of the Episcopal Church, it was established that the rightful owner of uh, the Rosen Fund was the Board of Foreign Parishes. Uh, for some time, both institutions, the Convocation and the Board of Foreign Parishes, had carried the Royal Fund on their own balance sheet, which was not right. So we removed the, the Royal Fund from, from our balance sheet, which of course caused a reduction in the net value of the Convocation's assets to, uh, to the tune of 211,000 euros. This cannot go unnoticed if you have read the, uh, the statement of financial position of the convocation at the end of 2020, compared it with the same uh, document at the end of 2019. So having a surplus in our operations helped soften the consequences of this transfer of the Rosen Fund to the Board of Foreign Parishes. This has more than, more than one advantage. First, of course, we are rectifying a situation which was not normal. And second, we started solving a problem which I had already mentioned, I think. There was a tax problem. Having income from financial investment on our balance sheet sort of removes that risk from from our shoulders because instead of having financial income from investment we received grants from the Board of Foreign Parishes. We request those grants. We didn't use that facility in 2020, and we will only use it if needed. And within the scope of the goal, the aim of the Rotom Fund, which is to support uh, youth ministry and new missions in Europe. So it was a positive year from a financial point of view. I'm glad to say that if we look at the figures for 2021, uh, same profile without the heavy support of the Board of Foreign Parishes. We had support from DFMS, but not from the Board of Foreign Parishes at this stage. And we don't anticipate to receive any support from the Board of Foreign Parishes, apart from the moral, moral support. But we went on with the policy of defeasance, which we started with the Rotham Fund, and we did the same thing in 2021. Uh, with Trust Fund 1145, you may remember that in 2016, uh, the Convocation had invested its cash assets held with DFMS as in a custodial account, which bore no interest or virtually no interest, and invested $250,000 at the time in a 
in the general trust fund of the Episcopal Church. And this investment was called, identified in our account as Trust Fund 1145. Very successful investment, by the way. But same situation, which caused the same problem, tax exposure in France. So it was decided also that this trust fund would be, of which we were the legal owners, would be transferred to the Board of Foreign Parishes as a gift to the Board of Foreign Parishes and the Assemblée Générale of the Association Convocation of Episcopal Churches in Europe was held at the end of June to allow uh, this transfer to the Board of Foreign Parishes. And last we heard was that the Board of Foreign Parishes not only had accepted the gift, but had, uh, had booked it in their, on their own, balance, their own balance sheets. So instead of being the owners of the trust fund, we now are the beneficiaries. And instead of getting interest or a dividend, we receive grants from the Board of Foreign Parishes, and grants are not taxable. So the fiscal year 2021 should also be positive. From what we can see now at the end of, of uh, uh, figures at the end of September, uh, we already had a positive uh, net result of 85,000 euros. So we expect that at the end of the year, we will again carry that sizable operating surface, which, is, which again will help limit the consequences of the defeasance of Trust Fund 1145, which was a big amount, it was like 300, almost 330,000 euros. Remember that we had to invest $250,000, and that is 327,000 euros is the book value of the investment, not its market value, which is higher than that. So, if you have any questions on fiscal year 2020, shall we take the questions now, Bishop, or shall we wait until we have? Uh, if, I, if I may, I think we'll maybe proceed with the presentation of the proposed budget, and I'll explain a little bit about procedure, and then we'll go. So, let me just remind all of us about the two roles that each of you has in this room this morning. We are presently convened as the fourth session of our annual convention. As soon as I finish with my remarks about budget, the convention will go into recess, and we will then convene ourselves again without getting up, sitting down, changing rooms, or anything else, as the Assemblée Générale of the Association of the Convocation, which is the legal entity in France, right, that is the fiduciary of the Convocation. And it is that body which has to both approve the audited financial statement for the previous year and approve the proposed budget for the next year. So the one thing we're actually not talking about is the time in which we now live. We talk about last year, we talk about next year, okay? And then we will, th under that aegis, we can have questions and discussion, okay? Oh, perhaps others. So, prepare ourselves to vote both here in the room and to our delegates who are online. All right. 
So some general observations about the planning assumptions that have gone into our budget thinking for next year. The pandemic is not over. I said this in my address to you yesterday. There is volatility ahead. We know that it will be ahead. We just don't know what form it will take. Um, the 5% reduction in assessments of congregations that then you mentioned, the Council of Advice put into place, no kidding, within weeks after lockdowns began, um, will continue. They continue this year. We propose that they will continue next year as well. And then you mentioned the change in the 2021 balance sheet, the change we made about Fund 1145. That does not affect the operational budget, the operational work of the convocation. It does affect where the income comes from. It now comes to us in the form of grants from the Board of Foreign Parishes and not in the form of campaigns from the Domestic Foreign Missionary Society. This is a, a, a distinction without a difference in most, in most cases. Here's the most important thing for me to say. Our operations are resuming. We are beginning to travel again. Here we are meeting in person again. Our commissions and committees are beginning to pick up steam again. But our income is still uncertain. We don't know what that future holds. And so, as a bishop, and I think I have the mind of the Finance Committee on this as well, we just feel we have to be have to be as careful as we can. We have a major expense ahead of us in the coming year that we know about, and it is the general convention of the Episcopal Church. Now, there are some aspects about the coming general convention that will be, if anything about general convention can possibly be money saving, uh, will be money saving. One is it will be shorter than in years past, and another is that, helpfully to us, it's on the eastern coast of the United States, in the city of Baltimore. So we think that our expenses this coming year will be a little bit less than in past years. And that's why we're budgeting as we are. But I also think that if we have needs that go beyond our budget, we should just raise them from other, other sources. We now have ministry initiatives in the convocation that will be begun as task forces in, at our 2019 convention. They are the Group on Racism, Reconciliation, Beloved Community, the Group on uh, Ministry with Migrants and Refugees, and the Group on Climate and Creation here. It, it makes no sense to me as a bishop to have ministry initiatives that are not resourced, so we're providing modest resources for each of those. There is a significant growth in our budget for, in our ministry focus on children and youth in the Congress. And in particular, um, identifying two qualified, eager, engaged folks to be share the role of coordinator for ministry. We're not going to make them divvy up one pie. We're going to we're going to compensate them both. And so that is a significant growth. And I am more than willing to defend an increase in investment in children and youth in the congregation. And so all of this means that wherever we can, we've needed to save money. So, I came from a land where we call these pie charts, but I now glory in calling them come up there. <laughs> <laughs> Here is the general picture for anticipated revenue for 2022. I will roll around this clockwise beginning at noon. So our assessments from congregations uh, appear to us to be on the order of 45% of the overall picture. Our investment income, we are, we are taking a very conservative projection on this uh, at 37% of our overall picture. Loan repayments means those of you who took advantage of the facility made available by the Board of Foreign Parishes through the convocation. You may remember the way that worked for you was the same way that it worked for us. We received half of those funds as an outright grant and the other half has a zero interest loan that the convocation has to pay back over the space of five years. And those same terms apply to congregations that receive those funds from us. And so part of our income picture is now those loan repayments, which come in at $20,000. Um, 
Um, we always, I am always in the business of trying to generate donations and gifts and It's significantly well in this area. And finally, there is a transfer from Missouri. Now, we live under the rule we must bring to the budget that is balanced. Sorry. I'll just continue. We live under the rule that we must bring to our budget the balance as between revenue and expenses. We can't bring to you, we can't bring this to the deficit. You will remember the number of loans that we should pay me by my trade. That we have oh, 2020 in, in a significant surplus. Position. So we, we have, have been very, very careful about the resources that you have trusted us. And we now think the right use for those reserves is to get us back on an operational path that looks, path like, that looks normal. like normal by drawing by drawing essentially 2020, 2020 pay for pay 2020. 2020. That's 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 what that's what that transfer from reserve needs. It's also not, as you can see, by any means all of that reserve. It's, it's a fraction of that reserve. But that is the way we think to, to balance the expenses that we propose in the 2022 budget, to which I will now turn. Here is the, is it a Calvin Barrett or is it Holden? <laughs> this, is the, this is the expenses expected for 2022. And let me just begin again from the top. Convocation governance now is a 22% slice of this pie. And remember that the part of the governance is general convention. That's our part of the governance. So that is a big, big, big up like big growth there for one year because of that kind of bulge in expenses. Relationships are things like our financial gifts to the Anglican Center in Rome, our support of the Anglican Network. It's a very small percentage of, our, of what we do, and it's, I'm sorry to say that that's a place that some cuts have fallen this year. Next section is our canonically established commissions and committees for ministry. Commission on the Ministry of Baptized stands at about the same. Children and Youth has a significant increase for reasons that I've already discussed. The European Institute for Christians has a little less budget than I personally like to see. But we've learned that we can do a lot, like especially the Academy for Parish Leadership <laughs> for the last two years. Then, as I mentioned, we have ministry initiatives that we really do need to build our services for. That's what follows climate and creation here, migrants and refugees, and racism, reconciliation, and the love of the community. We thank you for the support of congregations. This is the, we, we spend this money in a lot of different ways, much of which you already know. It has to do with everything from the digital enrichment grants that we've made available and will continue to make available um, in the year to come to when um, Ascension in Munich calls a new priest in charge. Uh, we are obligated to undergo background changes, and that, that there's a cost associated with that. So anything we do that supports the ministry of our congregation, that is essentially a reinvestment into our congregations, comes under this rubric. Support of clergy is the money that we use to attend to the welfare, the health, the mental, the spiritual, physical health of our people in the clergy. It's what we use to go on a retreat. It's where we spend some very small resources on support of the, of the spouses and partners of our clergy. The bishop's piece of this, as you all know, if you don't, you should. The convocation does not pay the bishop. And the convocation does not ensure the bishop. What you do provide for is the bishop's travel and the bishop's expenses. This number is a, is a cut from uh, last year, and that number was a cut from the previous year. 
I didn't, I didn't travel much in 2020, so we saved a lot of money there. Um, but I think we need to make economies here. So this number is now down to about um, a little more than half of the budget I inherited. And then we move into kind of the administrative pieces of the convocation, our archdeacon, our canon for administration, digital ministry has a 25% increase for the digital ministry coordinator for reasons that are, I am absolutely certain apparent to all of you. Administration is the place where we pay for the rent, the lights, the heat, the paper and the copier um, at the cathedral. So that is the whole picture. And what you see is that the budget that we propose is a balanced budget at a total of 534,315 euros. Here ends the presentation on the proposed budget for 2022. And I now recess the convention. And I call to order the Assemblée Générale of the Association 1901 Convocation of Episcopal Churches in Europe. Painless, right? Mm -hmm. So now we are convened in that way. And you just know that has its own agenda. The chair moves the approval of the newly elected bureau counts as the Council of Advice. The Council of Advice that we elected becomes the Conseil of the Association. And just to, to remind us all, the Council of Advice is now Richard Easterling, Sonny Hallam, I'm doing this from memory, I shouldn't be doing it that way, Michael Ross, Mary Haddad, Debbie Grovey, Lois Snooker Group, Vince Ricardo, David Kings. Is there a second? Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying no. Any opposed say no. Bureau is adopted, except whatever we would say. You're, you're, you're it. The chair moves the approval of the audited 2020 financial report as presented in the delegates packet. Is there a second? Second. Are there any, is there any discussion? Let me just say, brothers and sisters, if you wish to speak to any question this day before the convention, if you are present here in the room in Nice, you should come forward to this microphone. That will make sure that everybody here and everybody at home can both hear and see. Are there any questions or is there any discussion about the audited financial statement? Yes. We have one 60 seconds. Pause. Yeah. The meeting will be in recess.
favor of a proposed budget for 22 entered in the delegates back to Aye. 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 No. The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. All right. We now resume the meeting of convention with a report of the Council of Events. Well, it's not, but over to you. Good. Just say that uh, I was happy to do the report uh, on behalf of council, but I also have a choice of that, and it is required by canon. Uh, uh, I quote in canon. Uh, canon 3, section 2 says that the full report of the acts of the council of vice shall be made at each annual meeting of the convention. And uh, the fullness of the report is for the judge. But I was given 15 minutes, so it's uh, my definition. That they can't see it too, because they can look like the same there. So I've, uh, who is on the council? This is how I start. And uh, a lot of these slides are stolen from my predecessors. Not the pictures I should have. Careful observers might note that the people on this picture are actually on the pictures, they're slightly less gray than they are today. Um, I did take some screenshots of the course of this year, but unfortunately on them, one, it was always somebody not smiling. Um, and so I dug out actually a photograph that was taken last year. The advantage being is there have been different change the composition of the council um, and was able to use the same one. The only person not pictured are the council for clergy and for lay members who showed the bishop, the bishop showed, and regular guests, the treasurer, the archdeacon, uh, and Sophie, complicated administrator, and very often, recently, our digital coordinator, the mayor, is not shown in the picture, but you've seen her live and you have many other opportunities. Next slide, please. Pretty much a slide I showed last year, but I know we're not all the same people, and it's always worth reminding you um, what we actually do. Um, we do three different functions um, that in the diocese are divided between the standing committee, the council of advice, the standing committee and council of advice cannot be the same, and the office of the council, which is always a separate body. Standing committee functions are the ones often clearly established in the general canons. Um, have a lot to do with our role in coordination processes, uh, in the election of bishops, um, in anybody desiring to sell something that they own, um, the property of the church, uh, and if any of our parishes want to change their articles of association, charters, institutions, bylaws, or whatever they may be called, that change must be given to council first, uh, council and bishops. And also this new When we function as the Bishop's Council of Vice, we advise, let's say him, let's say him at the moment, uh, on the 
description. And we will get it. Doesn't it? Which The Gov says the council loans have to do to be financial, have to do with the budget process. In explaining in detail, uh, and our funds and organizations chart. Any more? Next time. And you can wait to write it. It's visible at all. So I will. We had to give the phone a shake. Uh, we met eight times last year, which is about the number of times we always meet. Um, uh, of course, we only met physically once, and that was here uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, otherwise, we other meetings, whether they were single evening meetings or multi day meetings, were on Zoom. Um, I'm certain that, that has to do with money, it also has to do with efficiency, it has to do with ecology. Well, I'm relatively certain without having said the matter anymore, we probably won't meet physically, or we probably won't meet physically as much as they used to in the past. Um, although physical meetings are important, um, and the council and the bishop must meet in person as well. There was so much that goes on outside the agenda, which we just can't do on the screen. Um, next slide. Signal about to so up to a satellite or back again. Um, that at these meetings and in fulfilling those three areas I mentioned earlier, a big task, especially following a convention, uh, is uh, putting into effect this implement all the things that you have decided here, or we have decided together. Uh, last year was particularly as we worked out how to continue the work of the task forces that were brought to the last convention. Um, we appointed new officers that came out of the task forces. We began to structure the listening process that you asked for as one of the main resolutions of the last convention, picking up the bishop's ideas and advising on those. Um, and as we looked at the survey results um, that came out of the uh, the London community task force that they had prepared, and they were presented to us, and we talked about those as well. We continue to advise and support the bishop in reacting to the COVID-19 pandemic, with a particular focus, of course, last year on the reopening strategy, um, as much as it could be inverted commas controlled, because gradually over time, of course, all the countries started moving at different speeds, and our parishes had to move at different speeds as well. There were most of almost all meetings, we were uh, receiving financial reports, we approved grants, um, and uh, we I proposed the 22, 2022 budget um, as presented to us by the Finance Committee, and as you will see, we have it moved together. We try and keep in touch with you uh, via our uh, liaison networks, um, both actively before the meetings, and of course, your liaisons, um, who you should know, and who will now be reappointed by the new council. Um, always have a look here for anything that you want to bring to their attention. And we dealt with a number of legal and tax issues, most of which have already been mentioned. I won't go into them, possibly great in interest, especially for our French congregations, but not just if there is a new legal environment in France, both in 1901 and to a certain extent 1905 associations. It all has to do, as in so many other countries, with attempts by our governments to combat Islamism. Uh, but of course, as they can't just target uh, mosques, uh, they have to introduce laws that affect all religious organizations. And we tend to get hit by the high. Um, and there's a particularly difficult one coming from France. At, at best, it will uh, add to our reporting requirements, our financial reporting requirements. Um, at worst, um, it could lead to um, a lot more work and justification. Uh, we have to work out what that means um, as we are incorporated in France. Uh, and finally, there's been an issue, that, a tiny little issue that popped up with an organization uh, using the words Anglican and convocation, uh, which we didn't like. Uh, from the Gatcon side, uh, where with the help of um, wedding going on, uh, with the help of DFMS, who very kindly financed uh, after the costs at least, um, we have managed to copyright the publication name and logo, which should give us some defense going forward. Next slide, please.
Despite the large number of policies we managed to introduce last year, there are still aspects of your life that have not yet managed to regulate. Uh, so we have uh, had some new updated policies and procedures. The Wayland Fund for the Creative Arts asked their charter to be updated after that experience of the first years to make the process of getting a grant from them easier. Uh, and we were happy to approve that. Uh, we approved a convocation digital archive policy that came from the Communications Committee. We revised our own rules of order uh, uh, here of the Council of Vice and uh, as requested by the Climate and Creation Care Task Force uh, or a mission initiative, we approved a revised convocation travel policy. On the mission side, we officially dissolved um, uh, Juan Pastor de Milan. We officially approved uh, the Mission Fiscal for the La Reza Lexon, uh, as welcomed several times, joyfully in this convention. And we supported a new a fresh start for St. Columbus Castle, where you uh, already mentioned and uh, recently received Robert Vukovic at the Bishop's invitation, will be helping to serve uh, and helping them move forward. We consented to six bishop elections. When I first wrote this slide, it says five, but one came in at the beginning of this week, and I just managed to get that in my tenure. We have consented to six bishop elections, and we approved one reception as a priest. Next and last slide, please. What do we need from you um, as council? What does the council need from you? Um, your prayers, please, always, always welcome. Uh, always necessary. We uh, would like your active communication. When we ask you questions as liaisons, do please answer those. Do please answer them timely. It helps us prepare the meetings much better. And if you have something and you want to, you know, something that's urgent, tell us about it, please. Uh, and if we are remiss in reporting back to you, um, tell your liaison, tell somebody else. I, blame is never a portion in one direction. We want to help and support in implementing convention resolutions. When we decide something, dear folks, let's all implement it. Sometimes it is a little bit frustrating when we discover through the liaison reports that we've all decided with huge majorities here that we all want to do something and then we all go home and don't. Um, don't do it. If you don't like it, don't approve it in the first place. And what we really need from you, and that's not just concerning council, just as some, just some of the voices that stand here for your application, uh, we need your willingness to get involved at all levels. Um, we now have a fresh council, but uh, start thinking uh, already. There will be an election next year. Uh, thinking about people in your parishes on the layside. Think about people who can get involved in that. So we almost have fresh blood. Uh, and new faces. Think about all the other roles that are available in here that help us complication run. It is mostly run by us. We have very few people who play badly. Um, <clears throat> and most of it is done by, by volunteers. What we promise um, from us is, of course, our service as council. Uh, it is um, a joy and a privilege uh, to be able to serve in this role, to be able to share in the governance of the church, be able to work with the bishop, uh, helping uh, him implement his ideas and to help uh, move forward God's mission in Europe. Um, that is something we enjoy. So we thank you also for the trust for forgiveness for putting us in this position. Uh, and I particularly, as I now look back uh, on four years uh, and say goodbye. Are there any questions? Are there any comments that go to the to the council? I'll merely repeat um, some things I've said previously. The, the council, your council, has been indispensable in helping us navigate our way through the pandemic. And my deep gratitude goes to each of you for all the time that they've Invested all the effort, all the ingenuity, all the worry, um, all of the prayer that they give to that ministry. It's, it's truly an exercise of shared governance in our church. And I am deeply thankful for all of you. So 
So we come down to the fifth session of the convention. <clears throat> 40 minutes ahead of time. <clears throat> and although the, the gentleman to my left is enthused about that, uh, the reality is the committee to respond to the convocation to the conversation yesterday um, you may not get to hear because they have some work they've been doing. Now, I, I would never dare to correct any of my clergy in a sermon that they have preached. I would, however, uh, suggest that the president of the Council of Advice was a little bit ahead of himself uh, in his sermon today when he said that we had appointed this committee on Thursday, uh, because in fact, the chair tabled that motion. Uh, I now ask unanimous consent uh, to the naming of the Reverend Stephen McHugh, the Reverend Nathaniel Katz, Gabrielle Conforti, uh, Anita Yurovsky, and Janet DeStrella to the committee to respond to the con conversation without objection. So ordered. So those five people are at this very moment consuming coffee somewhere in the at a rapid rate, trying to get their thoughts together in order to present them to you at 11.30. So I am going to ask the, the wisdom and advice of the delegates present. Do you wish to be in recess for half an hour? And give yourselves time for air. Yes? I see thumbs up. All right. So we say to those who are joining us from from Zoom, we, we will be in sorry. We have six countries and eighteen people that are not reporting. Oh wow! I don't know if you heard that. We have six countries and eighteen delegates who are zooming in to this meeting. So we are truly uh, widespread. Um, two matters, if I may, very briefly to use the privilege of the chair. First is, today is Mary Haddad's birthday. Oh. And I Happy birthday to you. Happy
Marcos. Word recites. <clears throat>
Prayer, we welcome new missions in the convocation. And in the report of the president of the Council of Advice, it was mentioned that missions don't only just open, sometimes they come to an end. Our mission in Milan has come to an end. And our mission in Orvieto, with input from the Committee on Mission Congregations and from St. Paul's in Rome, which has long been the sponsor of that mission. And it has been decided that Orvieto is a mission that also will, will be closing. That's never a happy moment for us, but we also know that we don't, we don't plant missions with the intent that they become parishes. We plant them to serve a need and the answer to a call. And if that need no longer exists and the call moves on to some other place, so will we. So our purpose in observing this is to give thanks for the service of our brother Francisco Alvesa, who has faithfully tended that community and, and to pray God's blessing on him and on the people of that community who have been through the doors of the place and received some grace, some hope, some love from that mission during its time. A little video has been prepared of that mission. And when Malia has it ready, we're going to see it. And that's what we're going to do before we formally read.
Orvieto is built on a hill, 350 meters above a valley, with origins that go back to pre-Christian times. A magnificent cathedral was built in the 14th century. Of interest to Anglicans, Orvieto was an occasional residence for the popes. In 1527, Henry VIII sent his request for a divorce from Catherine of Aragon to Pope Clement VII in Orvieto. 500 years later, a woman priest from the United States would gather a mission congregation in Orvieto for the convocation of Episcopal churches in Europe. Susan Skillen was from Massachusetts and ordained a priest at St. Paul's within the walls in 2005. Under St. Paul's sponsorship, she started the mission in Orvieto, where her husband directed a studies program for Gordon College. Initially, the mission congregation gathered in Susan's apartment, then the San Ludovico convent, and in 2007, services were held in Orvieto's papal palace at the invitation of the Roman Catholic Bishop of Orvieto. In 2008, Russell Rufino, a retired priest from Rhode Island, was appointed vicar by Bishop Pierre Whelan upon the recommendation of Reverend Michael Bono, rector of St. Paul's. A two-room office space was rented on Corso Cavour, the main street of Orvieto, providing a chapel and a space for other activities. In 2009, the choir from St. Paul's presented a Christmas concert to the inmates at the prison in Orvieto and then went carol singing through the city streets, a tradition that continued for many years. In 2012, the Church of the Resurrection moved to a new location at Piazza Angelo da Orvieto that was provided by the Bishop of Orvieto at no cost. In 2012, Father Francisco Alberca, an Episcopal priest assisting at St. Paul's in Rome and living in Orvieto, was appointed vicar of the Church of the Resurrection. Father Francisco's ministry in Orvieto included counseling, hospital and prison visitations, children's activities, as well as ecumenical participation with the Catholic community. Throughout its 16 years of existence, the Church of the Resurrection exercised meaningful ministry in the heart of Orvieto and touched the lives of many people. While the changing demographics and dynamics in the area have brought the organized character of its mission to a close. We know that the good seed that has been planted among those who made the Church of the Resurrection their home will continue to be watered by the God of life whose kingdom has no end. We thank God for the faithful ministry of the laity and clergy who served God in the Church of the Resurrection throughout these 16 years and also give thanks to the Convocation and the Commission on Mission Congregations for its care and support. Today, as a people who proclaim the resurrection, we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. As we carry with us the many joys of these years, and we look forward in hope to the life of the world to come.
is not with us this gathering. But he is still with us. He's a priest of the congregation. He remains the vicar of the Latin American community in Rome. So keep him in your prayers as he makes what will be a difficult transition. Francisco, there you are. My brother, we love you. And we're so glad to see you on that screen. Thank you for your faithful ministry to that community, for your relentless efforts to, to be a source of joy and good mornings when we gather. We thank you, Francisco. We can't see all of us here, but we're gonna we're gonna clap. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to move on to as the fifth session of the convention. I may all up to the front representatives of the committee to respond to the conversation. I don't know whom you've appointed to do this, but I see Stephen McKee on his feet and also Matt Katz, who might have just been moving, is coming forward. I don't want to be at that mic. Which mic is? Right, right there. Good morning. May I ask uh, the other two from our committee if you're here to join us? Gabrielle and Nida, yeah. So, it, oh my gosh, you guys gave us work to do. <laughs> this was not a normal committee to respond because we didn't just uh, respond to Bishop's address, but we responded to the many amazing comments from nine groups. And can you all come stand here on both sides because Felicity wants to get a picture of us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. anywhere. So I guess I can, okay, there we go. Anyway, I wanna thank, uh, thank these precious people, plus Anita, um, uh, who was joining us via Zoom, tried to have our sessions where she's from Geneva, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and she would dial in and also give her input. And so we took a lot of time um, reading through the input and looking for parallel themes. And so it was very tempting to, uh, to try and in the resolution say, let's do this and let's do that. But we realized that's not really our task. Our task is to back up a little bit and then to craft resolutions that would enable a further process. So that's what we've done. Do you want me to read the resolution or? Well, what I've got on the first slide is your Thessalonians. Okay. So we started with a quote from Thessalonians 5 verses 11 to 13. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And then we, our resolutions come in the three divisions of the questions or the prompts that you, uh, that you processed during the sessions. Uh, the first resolution, actions to be taken before the 2022 convention proposed by the committee to respond to the conversation. So I'll, I'll cover the first and then maybe different ones we could cover the second two. So the convention, following the challenging address of Bishop Mark Eddington and the in-depth conversations of the great
Number two, that the Bishop and Council of Advice appoint a committee to carefully collate the data gleaned from the breakout groups and publish and disseminate it at the guidance of the Communications Committee and Tech Team. Number three, that the Bishop and Council of Advice continue to support the four existing task forces and the other committees and com commissions in discerning and defining specific actions from the Convention 2021 breakout group conversations to implement within their areas. We call on the aforementioned groups to report back to the 2022 convention. And lastly, number four, that the Bishop and Council of Advice convene learning opportunities for entities and groups within the convocation to together define what missional church means for us. Resolution 2021, number eight. Actions to be taken before the 2024 convention. That's a cheap Sorry. general convention. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that is the reference. Following the challenging address of Bishop, Bishop Mark Eddington and the in-depth conversation of the breakout groups at this 2021 convention, inviting us to articulate. Is this? It's been turned off. How's that? Oh. Do I have to read that? Resident 2021. Actions to be taken for 2024 convention. Following the challenging address of Bishop Mark Eddington and the in depth conversations of the breakout groups at this 2021 convention, inviting us to articulate our ambition for the future convocation, we resolve as follows that the Council of Advice initiate the process of discerning and positive an identity of the CDC including the shift from a primarily English-speaking church to a multicultural, multilingual church. Two, that the bishop engage in conversations that lead to clarification of our Anglican identity in relation to the Church of England and Anglican community, respectively, and to keep the convocation informed and report progress made to the 2024 convention. Number three, that the bishop, archdeacon, council of advice, and committee on mission convocation Refine the process of identifying and accepting new mission congregations based on the new defined understanding of the mission of the church. I can't make it. So, again, following the challenging address address of Bishop Mark Eddington and the in-depth conversations of the breakout groups of this 2021 convention, inviting us to articulate our ambitions for the future of the convocation. We resolve that the Bishop and Council of Advice appoint a strategic planning committee by convention 2022 based on information gathered through the listening and learning process to guide us in living out the promise of being a missional church by 2031. The address of Bishop Mark Eddington and the nine breakout groups presented overarching themes that consistently fell into three major categories. Relationships within CECE, relationships between us and other churches, and relationships between our church and society. The input reflected the many issues, concerns, aspirations, aspirations and dreams carried by those present that point to a vibrant future for the convocation of Episcopal churches in Europe. I thank the committee. Um, the hour is now 11 .54. Lunch is laid for you at the Forum we all had lunch yesterday at one o'clock. If 
if you wish to have lunch today, we have to leave here by 12.50. So we have a little less than an hour to do our work. Here is what I'm going to propose. I'm going to consider each of the resolutions that you just heard to be moved. First, to ask for a for resolution 2021-7, which is the resolution on actions to be taken in the next year. Second. Is there a second? Second. Are there questions or discussion? And I remind you that if you wish to ask a question, you need to come to the microphone. In our way of doing work under Robert's rules, questions are addressed to the chair. If I need clarification on something, I will ask but this is not a time for us to talk about the relative merits of ideas. It's a time to make specific suggestions about changes to the resolution in the form of amendments, if any are necessary, so that we can move toward a conclusion. Any questions? Ann Swartz, will you please come to the mic? And maybe not that way. Follow the arrows. Hopefully, put on the floor. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking of, from the point of view of the resolutions committee, uh, can we adopt these with the understanding that teeny little punctuation tweaks and that kind of thing may be necessary? We may. In in the in the phraseology of this sort of work, those are known as scrivener's errors. And scrivener's errors are within the control of the chair to, to make without need to contest. So yes, the answer is yes. Other questions? Oh, yes. yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to propose an amendment to number three, and yeah. number three, where we refer to the four existing task forces, and that is to replace the word task forces by mission initiatives. As we dissolve the task forces, move to amend the two words task forces to ministry initiatives to conform with current usage. Is there a second? Yeah. Is there any discussion? All in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed to the contrary? No. Motion carries. Is there any other question or amendment to the resolution? Checking my chat. Hearing none, I call the question. The question is the approval of resolution 2021-7 actions to be taken before the 22 convention. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion carries. It's been moved. We hear resolution 2021-8, actions to be taken before the 2024 convention. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions on this resolution? Um, I, I guess it's going to be a scrivener's error. I'll just say, if I may, colleagues, it is the Anglican community, not the Anglican community. It is sort of a community, but it is the community. And if I may, that, we're just going to call that a scrivener's error. And I'll just, okay, so. Questions or discussion? Hearing none, the question is approval of resolution 2021-8, actions to be taken before the 2024 convention. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Motion carries. It's been moved that we consider act resolution 2021-9, actions to be taken within the next 10 years. Is there a second? 
Second. There is a second. <laughs> <laughs> is there any discussion or are there any questions? Saying none, the question is the resolution actions to be taken within the next 10 years. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries. Thank you, committee, for undertaking an impossible task and, and showing that it was in fact possible. Thank you so much. So. We now turn to the report of the Committee on Resolutions. Resolutions proposed by the Council of Advice were considered and approved in the Thursday session. Resolutions approved, proposed by ministry initiatives are what we will now turn to these, and there are two. The first of these is a bit long. It's in the delegates' packet. Setting for you here is the slides, the resolution itself, which speak of the Episcopal. I do, in fact, have that as a slide. So may I ask Susan and Michael to come forward? We had hoped that these would be presented to you by Stephen Squire, who is, as many of you know, the head of the ministry initiative on climate and creation here. But Stephen's having a weekend like we are here and he's not able to get on it. So his colleagues on the initiative are going to present this resolution for him. Follow the arrows to avoid disaster. We send uh, greetings to the uh, chair of uh, this uh, important ministry in the convocation, uh, Stephen, who is in England at the moment. Uh, and we send our uh, condolences to him as he mourns his father's uh, passing. What we have before us is immensely topical because, as you know, the COP26 uh, summit is about to take place in Glasgow. And the aim of this resolution is to bring us into the mode of a prophetic voice in Europe to attend to perhaps the greatest challenge of our day, and that is responding to the climate emergency. And that is something that we are working hard to be advocates for, but which we want to bring through to our parishes and missions and convocation so that we live a life which is different from the life to which we've been accustomed to, uh, to learn to live more simply, to care for creation. And it actually affects each one of us personally. So it affects our whole concept of Christian stewardship, which moves beyond offering our time and talents and wealth uh, to serve as the church and the church's mission, but also invites us to be transformed and change our lifestyles in many sacrificial ways so that we uh, are uh, ones who are deeply aware of the damage to God's creation and as stewards and disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ are seeking to uh, respond by living in a way in keeping with the way God has called the whole of humanity to live by. Good morning. As you know, I'm part of the, um, it's now called Mission Initiative. And my role in this group, is it okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mission Initiative is a new name. Um, my role in this 
group has been at grassroots level. And what I've been trying to do over the last couple of years is establish a volunteer or a climate steward in each of the parishes and missions so that we can liaise with one another and discuss. I would urge every parish and every mission to appoint one person. So far, we've not been very successful. I have, I think, three or four people in the group and that's just not enough. So I, I can't urge you enough. Please, please find somebody in your group, your parish or mission, that's passionate about the climate, that takes it seriously. And just get in touch with me and that person will be part of our grassroots group. Unless everybody participates, we're not going to achieve anything. So it's up to you, right? This is a serious appeal. What have we been doing? Very briefly, it's as an appendix in the, to the resolution. We meet roughly once a month. We have little projects like, what can you do in the home? What can you do in your church? Um, we home in on very, very small daily things. And everybody can do this. Everybody can achieve something. Um, we're lucky that we now have Dawn Beatty as part of our team. Um, she is, as you probably know, if you've been talking, she's a volunteer in mission, which is part of the um, Episcopal Church program. And Dawn is going to help us close the gaps. I hope so. Um, her focus is going to be on pilgrimage, hiking, and communication support, which we definitely need. So we're <clears throat> looking forward to great things happening in this next year. So the other thing I would like to um, just say is um, it's all about raising awareness. And we can only do that through education. And I urge every one of you to think personally, what can you do? What can you do on a daily level, a personal level? What you can do maybe in your workplace and what you can do in your church. And we need to move forward on this. At the moment, we're treading water a little bit. So we definitely need input and to move forward. Thank you. I just want to be clear that uh, the resolution is moved, and what is moved is both these resolves, which you see on the screen, and that we are in, in taking note of this curiously titled Episcopal Covenant to Care of Creation. And that is its title, as, as received from the Episcopal Church. The, the covenant itself has also been included in your packet, okay? You now see it on the screen. Has been, we've taken the model of what's been given to us by the Episcopal Church and amended it to our own context. Is this correct? Use a second yes, for affirmation. Yes. Okay, good. So, so <laughs> our folks, our initiative, have taken on board, prayed through it, and, and given it back to us with their understanding of who we are and what we're called. That is the resolve. Is there a second? There are many seconds. All right. Is there discussion or question? Check in the chat. Thank you. Page 38 of the delegates packet. All right. Calling one more time for questions. 
Hearing none, I move the question. The question is the adoption of resolution 2021-5 presented by the Ministry Initiative uh, on, sorry folks, I'm just clicking total here, climate creation. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 No. The resolution carries. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Stephen. We come now to resolution 2021-6, which is proposed by uh, the Ministry Initiative on Migrants and Refugees. I do not know that um, Tom Huddleston is connected to this, is he? Not seen. Not seen. Okay. Is there someone from that initiative with us in the absence of it? I'm sorry, Sonny, you're going to have to come forward. Uh, look, so no, please. No. So, in the absence of that, I will simply read the resolve. Resolution 2021-6 20, is proposed by the Ministry Initiative on Migrants and Refugees. The convention, following the approval of a series of resolutions at the 2020 Convention, the Convocation and its parishes and missions to design new priorities and actions for building solidarity, community, witness, and welcome resolves as follows, that the convocation in each parish and mission reaffirm their commitments to continue to implement our 2020 resolutions on migrants and refugees, and there were nine of them, and to update the convocation's welcoming officers, those people are Thomas Huddleston and Jane McBride, on their future plans by December 31st of this year, that in addition, each parish and mission find ways within a specific context and partnerships to offer safety and support to our Afghan brothers and sisters, whether as asylum seekers in Europe or as evacuees in need of resettlement. The question has been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Is there any discussion? I would simply uh, report to you, as I have reported to the Council of Advice uh, earlier this week, that one of those resolutions uh, last year pertaining to Ministry with Migrants and Refugees called on the convocation to become a church member of the Church's Commission on Migrants in Europe. That was accomplished last week. So we are now members of that body. Uh, as a church, not, not, not as me or as a council, all of us together. Um, and that's, so we are executing on some of these things. Other questions? None in the chat. Hearing none, I call the question. The question is the adoption of resolution 2021-6. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 No. Motion carries. Thank you all. We move now to were, were there any other resolutions found in proper form? No, there were not. All right. Were there any found in improper form? No, there were not. <laughs> we then move now to courtesy resolutions. I'm happy to read those if that's appropriate. I want to take this opportunity to thank the members of my hardworking committee, Walter Bear and Ann Sports. I, if everyone is okay with this, I will read out the resolutions of courtesy. Um, these are being moved by the resolutions committee as a packet. Um, please withhold any applause or signs of disapproval before I reach the end. Resolved that the Convocation express its special greetings to the Most Reverend Michael Curry, the presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church, and 
to the Reverend Dr. Gay Jennings, the president of the House of Deputies. Greetings to the Right Reverend Robert Innes, the Church of England's of the Church of England's Diocese of Gibraltar in Europe. Warm thanks to the Reverend Peter Jackson, Mr. Joseph Volker, and the entire convention organizing team from the Church of the Holy Trinity, Nice, Diocese in Europe, for all their hard work, both last year and this year. Best wishes and prayers for a speedy recovery to Ms. Ms. Carol Ducastel Waterloo, retiring member of the Council of Advice, to Ms. Lizzie Sandlin, daughter of the Reverend Allen and Mrs. Gretchen Sandlin, and to the Reverend Susan Carter, Clement Ferrand. Condolences to Ms. Deirdre Tinker Munich on the death of her husband. Warm welcome to new clergy, the Reverend Robert Bukovich, Kauzwoy, the Reverend Dan Miro, Munich, and his wife, Teresa, and the Reverend Gregory Stark, Convocation Youth Co-Coordinator. Warm welcome to Ms. Dawn Beatty, Missioner for Climate and Creation Care, and member of the presiding bishop's delegation to the COP26. Congratulations to the Reverend Gregory Stark on his appointment to serve as Convocation Youth Co-Coordinator with the Reverend Katie Oswald. Deep gratitude to Ms. Malia Rios and Ms. Audrey Shankles for making this year's hybrid convention possible through their mastery of different and complicated technology platforms, for their loving attention to detail, and for their invariable calm and good humor. Thanks to Canon Sophie Clay, Convocation Administrator, for her preparation of the financial reports and for her dedication and hard work in the bishop's office throughout the year. Deep thanks and appreciation to the Most Reverend Jan Ernest, personal representative of the Archbishop of Canterbury to the Holy See and director of the Anglican Center, Rome, for his inspiring and challenging presentation and a warm welcome to his wife, Kamala. Deep gratitude to the Board of Foreign Parishes and the Boards for St. James Florence and St. Paul's within the Walls Rome for their continuing generous assistance to the Convocation and its congregations. Special welcome to all delegates and alternates attending the convention for the first time. Congratulations to the Mission Episcopal Francophone de la Résurrection in Paris on its admission as a mission of the Convocation and a warm welcome to the Reverend Jean Dumont Chabat and Ms. Laurence Moishe. Appreciation to Mr. John Adam, the Reverend Deacon Richard Cole, Ms. Carol Ducastel and the Reverend Chris Easthill, who have just completed their service to the Council of Advice, with special thanks to Chris for his wise leadership as its president. Special thanks to the committee to respond to the conversation for its careful consideration of the matters raised in the Bishop's vision for the Convocation's future mission and the input from the various discussion groups. Deep gratitude to the Council of Advice for its hard work and dedication. Special thanks to the Convocation Treasurer, Mr. Denis Le Mouillac, and the Assistant Treasurer, Mrs. Ms. Sorry, Helena and Bella and Bong, for their dedicated work in managing and reporting on Convocation finances. Gratitude to the Convocation Choir for enriching our music during worship. Gratitude for the hard work of the many elected and appointed individuals at Convocation level who continue to vision and strengthen the reality of our ministry in Europe and to encourage and support us as we travel along the way. Finally, deep gratitude to our Bishop, Mark D.W. Eddington, in the third year of his faithful leadership of our convocation, appreciation for his thoughtful, innovative, and effective chairmanship of convention, and for inspiring and challenging us in his address. On behalf of the Resolutions Committee, Mr. Chair, I move these resolutions as amendment. The resolutions have been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. There is a question. 
Dorothy, you must move forward to the mic. Um, Mr. Chairman, since we just heard uh, one person we sent condolences, but we just heard that Stephen Squire lost his father, so I think it would be appropriate to include him uh, and send condolences to him. And I would ask the question, since Bishop Inns is going on sabbatical, to wish him the best for this as well. I'm going to ask the permission of the group without objection to make those changes by unanimous consent. Hearing none, so ordered. Other questions? Jan. So this may be a scrivener's error, however you say it, but Ellen Sandlin's wife is not Sandlin, it's Gretchen Bosch. So no, it's okay. I just, um, it's a, I don't, I, I didn't get the last thing, so I'll take it. Yeah. Oh, no. Thank you. Other questions? Other changes? Hearing none, the question is the adoption of courtesy resolutions. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thanks to the committee. And I just wonder if you are here for the first time at a convention, would you please rise? You know, wow, thank you. I am not, I can't, by no means am I a veteran of the convocation, but I think that's a pretty significant percentage of us yeah. to be new. So that's, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. So thank you. We come now to the commissioning of the Council of Advice. And what I think I'm going to do, if I may, just a little tech housekeeping here. May I turn that webcam around 180 degrees to face the eye? I'm going to call forward the newly elected Council of Advice. I'm here too. <laughs> Yeah, we must have a little window screen. <laughs> Hi. There she is. <laughs> All right. So this, uh, dear friends, is in the form of a liturgy uh, because we're Episcopalians. <laughs> the good news is it's a little bit like a, a wedding. The only thing you have to say is I will. All right. And you'll know when. All right. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we are all baptized by the one spirit into one body and given gifts for a variety of ministries for the common good. Our purpose is to commission these persons in the name of God and of this convocation as members of the Council of Advice. I present to you these persons to be commissioned as the Council of Advice. To become the new members have been duly elected by this convention. Dear friends, you have been called on behalf of the convocation to go out as witnesses to the risen Christ, as his ambassadors, to uphold and seek to serve Christ in all persons and all places. In this ministry on the Council of Advice, you are called to exercise the gifts of administration, oversight, and vision in shared ministry with the bishop on behalf of the convocation. Are you willing to exercise this ministry? I will. 
Let us pray. Mighty God, look with favor upon these persons who have now reaffirmed their commitment to follow Christ and to serve in his name. Give them courage, patience, and vision, and strengthen us all in our Christian vocation of witness to the world, to steward and exercise and of service to others. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of God and of the convocation, I commission you, David Case, Debbie Groby, Lois Stukin, Vincenzo Rotana, Mary Haddad, Richard Easterman, Sonny Hallinan, and Michael Rouse as members of the Council of Advice. Let your life so shine before others, they may see your good works and give glory to God. I commend you in this work, and I pledge to you our prayers, encouragement, and support. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and bless us. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. At a short meeting of uh, the new council this morning, David Case was elected as president. The Reverend Michael Rust as Vice President and the Reverend Richard Easton uh, as the Secretary. Is there any other business to come before the convention? Cannot close without saying one more time. We could not do this without money. We made a commitment to make a hybrid convocation convention. We, the council of us, didn't have any idea how we were going to do it. But that problem got solved. And that's all down to the way. Yesterday, as we gathered for evening prayer, she said to me, I cannot take one more person saying thank you. <laughs> so be gentle in the way you say thank you. It's not always easy to receive all of that, but find a way to do it. Find a way to do it. Thank you, everybody. We've come to the end of the convention. We are now adjourned. Will you all please rise? And now may God, who leads the deer to water, and feeds the birds of the air, who multiplied the loaves and the fishes and changed the water into wine. Lead us, feed us, multiply us and change us that we may be better disciples, joyful followers, eager sharers of God's love in a dark and hurting world. And the blessing, the mercy, and the grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love and pray for 
in heaven and on earth, this day and always. Amen. 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 Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.